First of all, I want to say thank you so much for coming out. My name is Emily. I'm a librarian here at AADL, and I have just a tiny bit of housekeeping first. First is just to let you know if at any point you need to use the restrooms, head out the same door you came in, and they're to the left. Also, if any of you are summer game players, of course, there is a code associated with this event. The sign is outside, but if uh, you're itching for it right now, it's Stark Weather Tiffany. Uh, so you get 150 points for that. If you are not a summer game player, you can let that wash right over you. And if you're curious, you can talk to me afterwards and I can tell you all about it. I also want to say a big thank you for coming out. We've been doing a kind of experiment these last few months at AADL, doing more events for adults during the weekday. And we are finding, as you look around the room today, guess what? There are adults who like to come to the library during the day, during the weekday. And for many people, it can be an easier thing. Uh, so I love seeing you here because then I can uh, talk to the folks higher up and say, yes, please, let's keep doing this. And speaking of keeping doing this, um, we, we're doing one a month right now. Next month is on Tuesday, September 5th. It's from 2 to 3 p.m. at the Traverwood branch. And it's art history in the afternoon, focusing on the artist Rosa Bonheur, who is a female artist that you don't hear a whole lot about, but I have actually heard this lecture, give this lecture before. Fascinating. Don't want to miss it. Especially... Like you don't want to miss this next event, which I will segue into right now. Welcome to Epic Stained Glass of Metro Detroit. Uh, we are so lucky today to have Dale Carson Carlson. Dale is an author, uh, photograph, a photographer, and an architectural historian. He studied art, journalism, and graphic design at four Michigan colleges and also had a degree in ph photographic technology from Oakland Community College. Now, uh, Dale serves on the Berkeley, Michigan Historical Committee, and he has authored numerous books, ones that you can even buy and get signed from him after this event. How convenient. So now we're going to turn it over to you. Dale, welcome. Hi, everyone. What an awesome crowd tonight. Thank you all for coming. You guys can all hear me okay? Well, my name is Dale Carlson, and this is the third time that I'm presenting for the Ann Arbor Public Library, which is really great. I live in Berkeley, but I love coming out here. I actually lived in Ann Arbor for uh, seven years back in the, uh, uh, oh, around 1997 to 2004, actually. And Ann Arbor is one of my favorite destinations in the state of Michigan, so I love it when the library here is willing to hire me. Uh, I am the author of three books so far about architectural history. I've got a few more in the hopper at the moment. My very first book was uh, Corrado Parducci, A Field Guide to Detroit's Architectural Sculptor that I published in January of 2020. And I followed that published in 2022. It's a Cons Detroit, A Field Guide to Albert Kahn Designs of the Metro Area, and a month later, Stained Glass New Orleans, A Field Guide. And... Uh, well, before I get started with uh, talking about more about my books and my writing career and uh, the stained glass tonight, I want to thank the Ann Arbor District Library for inviting me to come out for the third time. Uh, Emily, Elise, and Claire, who's not here today, were all instrumental in helping me put this uh, together tonight, so thank you to them. And also the Michigan Stained Glass Census that you can find online really easily. This is an organization that's done an astounding amount of research on stained glass in the state of Michigan, and they've filled in a lot of the gaps in my research. So haven't ever met any of them personally yet, but one of these days I hope to be able to thank them to their face. I'm going to break down my lecture to you this uh, afternoon into five sections. I'm going to start off with a little bio myself and how I attained my expertise in the field of architectural history. Uh, we're going to look at uh, five significant makers that are uh, represented in the metro area. We're going to take a look at uh, what I believe to be some of the best uh, top local collections and unique installations. And we're also going to do a local extra that covers like five, six more, uh, mostly churches right here in, in Ann Arbor that uh, are by more obscure makers that don't have multiple installations in the metro area. And I'll finish it off with a Q&A. I actually think uh, you want to transpose points three and four there. I think I switched them around late in the lecture and forgot to change my index page. But anyway, let's get started with a bio of myself. I first started getting interested in Detroit's and Michigan's architectural history in the early 90s when I left my boyhood home of Traverse City, Michigan to attend university in East Lansing at Michigan State. 
And back then, I had a lot more hair. <laughs> There's my joke. There's my one joke, you guys. I hope you liked it. So I can't grow it like that anymore. I mean, I can get the back to go long, but I can't get the top to go long. And I think we all know how bad a bald on top and long in the back look is. Well, back then, when I first started going to MSU, one of my favorite things to do uh, was to drive to Detroit almost every single weekend to take in what was an exploding and very uh, groundbreaking house and techno music scene. And I would be in Detroit almost every weekend for about seven years on end. And as a wide-eyed youth, uh, seeing skyscrapers like this for the first time in my life, it definitely made an impression on me. And uh, architectural history, it became a pretty serious hobby for me for about the next 15 to 20 years. But I didn't start taking it super seriously until the early 2010s, when through online correspondence, I met a really interesting fellow by the name of Einar E. Kavaran. Einar is Icelandic by descent, which accounts for his... Uh, uh, slightly uncommon first name there. And he lives in suburban Phoenix now, but he lived in the Detroit area in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And he's really interested in architectural history here as well. In fact, he got a degree in uh, um, architectural preservation at EMU. Well, over a few months of corresponding with Einar, he eventually revealed to me that in the 1990s, he hunted down a son of the Detroit architectural sculptor Corrado Parducci, about whom I wrote my first book, and this son of Parducci allowed him to photocopy his father's original studio ledger spanning the years of 1924 to 1981, as well as a scrapbook of over 700 images of sculpture that Parducci created over the course of his career. Well, once Einar told me about these ledgers in the scrapbook, the gears of my mind began clicking, and I very shortly decided that I wanted to write a book about uh, this. This research material just fell in my lap. I felt a responsibility to do something really cool with it. And nobody in Detroit had written a book about Parducci yet. In case you guys don't know, there's about 20 Parducci's in Ann Arbor. If you care to uh, discover them, they're all enumerated in my book there. So it took me about seven years. I first got the idea to write this book in 2013, and I didn't release it until January 2020. There was a lot of bumps along the way, bumps in the road along the way. But uh, the m biggest was the fact that it was my first book I'd ever written. And I was completely inexperienced in this field when I started. But it was the experience of writing this book that really filled me in on what it takes to create. Success uh, to get the story straight and be able to back up the claims that you make about architectural history in the book. Over uh, in the course of writing the book, one of the uh, commissions I discovered was down in New Orleans, which is one of my favorite cities in the United States. Probably my second favorite, Detroit's number one. Well, in a studying this building and meeting some of the, of the people on the campus, I learned that there was uh, some sculptural detail on the interior as well. So I had to make friends with some people that work at the school and their director of alumni affairs, he's retired now, Matt Grout Jr., I ended up becoming friends with him. And when I finally put the book out in January of 2020, it was right around the time that I was starting a three month stay in New Orleans. And I had a dinner with Matt very early in my stay because I wanted to give him a free copy of the book for being so helpful. While we're at that dinner, I say to Matt, hey, I've really been getting into photographing stained glass lately because it was right at the end of when I got my degree at Oakland Community College. And Matt says, well, you gotta come back to the school then because we've got a chapel inside the school that was actually uh, all the stained glass in it was transplanted from the previous high school that used to be in downtown New Orleans that got down, torn down in the 20s. So this is stained glass that goes back to the late 19th century. And I took him up on his invitation and it was while I was photographing the interior of this chapel that I first got the idea in my head, hey, let's write a book about stained glass in New Orleans. And it was such a fulfilling experience that naturally when I got home to Detroit, I started working on a very similar project. This book is not out yet. It's probably still a couple years away, but I've masked, amassed probably about, I'm gonna say three eighths of the photography that is gonna be in this book when it eventually comes out, probably sometime in 2025 or 2026. Anyway, I think you guys can easily see how uh, um, I was blown away by the quality of the uh, glass inside. All of these are Jesuit missionaries that ended up uh, becoming martyrs. And you know, in the modern era, we have a much different perspective about it. When somebody shows up on the shores of a you know, third world country and says, here's your new God, 
Sometimes the natives don't take very kindly to it. And this is what ends up happening to, to you. And this really is not the tack that a lot of churches take these days. And for good reason, in my opinion. But these people are still regarded as heroes in the Catholic Church and the Jesuit community. And I think that their, uh, um, their life stories are really beautifully rendered uh, in these windows. But anyway, let's move on from New Orleans because we want to talk about Detroit. Again, I published the uh, New Orleans uh, St Stained Glass Guide in February 22. Sales have been a little bit sluggish. But uh, uh, writing the book and the experience of photographing all the glass is far more fulfilling than heavy sales anyway. So let's get started on Detroit's amazing stained glass legacy by taking a look at five different significant makers that are well represented in uh, the city and in the suburbs. And we're going to start with a company that went by a few different names over the course of its existence. They started out as Friedrichs and Staffen, but eventually they became commonly known as the Detroit Stained Glass Works. And in my opinion, this is the stained glass company that is most essential to the Detroit's architectural history because they're really only the only major stained glass house that are operated in Detroit for over a century, from the 1860s to the 1870s. So we can see that they changed their corporate moniker a few times uh, along the way. But if you take a close look at this free press uh, clipping here from 1881, we'll see that they start off calling the stained glass works and they finish off with Friedrichs and Staffen. So even from the beginning, Detroit Stained Glass Works and Friedrichs and Staffen, they're kind of interchangeable as this company's name. And if you look really, really closely at the highlighted part there, you'll see that they put a window in the Baptist Church in Ann Arbor over there on Huron Street. And we're going to cover that window in a second. I made that discovery while I was doing this lecture. Nobody else has put an attribution to that window, uh, to my knowledge, ever. So writing these lectures, it's a huge learning experience, uh, as well as, uh, you know, putting out the knowledge that you already have, you always learn something new. And that was one of the things that I learned along the way. So let's look at a few of uh, their designs here. And they've got a lot of really, really great installations in Detroit. This is uh, inside a building that used to be known as St. Joseph Catholic Church, but it's recently uh, been changed to St. Joseph Shrine. And this is definitely one of the most interesting examples in all of the metro area, because it's very, very rare for two different companies to produce one pane of glass, which is what happened here. The saints and the pinnacles above their heads, those are all produced by the Franz Mayer Company of Munich and imported to the United States. And when they get here to the United States, the Detroit Stained Glass Company, they fuse the elements made by Franz Mayer with the pattern elements that they produce in their own uh, uh, studio, and they fuse them together for those windows. And that's really super rare. You hardly ever see that anywhere. So that's definitely one of the most interesting examples in all of the metro area. Uh, right here in Ann Arbor at 580 East Huron, the one we just talked about from the clipping, is a rose window in the choir loft of First Baptist Church. Sadly, somebody along the line decided that organ music is more important to the church than visual art and put all these pipes up in the way that prevent you from getting a really great photo of it. But a lot of church girls really love organ music and consider it just as important to uh, the ceremony as stained glass. I personally love stained glass a little bit more and wish those weren't in the way. Uh, moving into the city of Detroit now, uh, Detroit has a lot of old Catholic churches, some of them that aren't used as much as you'd like to see them used, unfortunately. And this one here, St. Albertus, it's mostly run as a museum by the descendants of the Polish Catholics that originally inhabited it in the late 19th century and early 20th century. In fact, this part of Detroit was so full of Pol Polish Catholics in the late 1800s and early 1900s that there were three Catholic churches within a mile of each other, and every, all three of them were full every Sunday. So now this is kind of a blighted area of town, and this is run almost exclusively as a museum. They only do a couple of masses a year here. But thank God they're running it as a museum because they've kept the interior in meticulous condition, and the uh, stained glass here is uh, quite a different, uh, quite a number of makers. Uh, but uh, uh, Detroit Stained Glass Works do have major installations, I believe, on I want to say three walls. And uh, I think you guys will agree with me. Pretty darn gorgeous. Uh, uh, in the downtown area, in Greek Town, you may have noticed the Old St. Mary's Catholic Church. It's pretty imposing. It's um, hard to not notice. Uh, they've also got a variety of stained glass makers inside, but one of their most impressive works, in my opinion, 
Uh, oh, I'm sorry. It's not Old St. Mary's. Old St. Mary's is almost exclusively a, um, a Detroit stained glass works. We'll get to the other church I was just about to mention, St. Anne, in a second. But uh, pretty much every window you see here is stained Detroit stained glass works. Not sure about these guys over the door, but everything else definitely is. Absolutely gorgeous interior here. If you ever get a chance to uh, step inside, they open almost every weekday afternoon for a couple hours. Uh, so this is uh, one of the windows in the wall we just saw close up. And I wanted to give you a close up because it's very representative of uh, Detroit Stained Glass Works early work, which is almost always based in circles with geometric designs, which is kind of interesting because usually in churches, what you get is narrative glass that has Bible stories or saints depicted. And secular stained glass, for the most part, is significantly more rare than church stained glass. And for that reason, I find it just a little bit more interesting. Now, these are in a church, technically makes them ecclesiastical glass, but there's no religious symbolism in here at all, which to me makes it a nearly secular window. And for that reason, maybe just a little bit more interesting than uh, the typical scenes we uh, see depicted in church stained glass. But uh, this is really representative of their style, as I think you'll see in the next few examples by Friedrichs and Staffen. Uh, the next church we're going to stop at is St. Anne. This is in the southwest section of Detroit. This is actually the home of the second oldest parish in the United States. Only St. Augustine, Florida has an older parish. This is their eighth church they've had since, they, uh, since their parish began, the day that Cadillac got out of his boat on the shores of the Detroit River and built a chapel to St. Anne. Inside the church is stunningly beautiful including the rose window produced by the Detroit Stained Glass Works. And this was most likely installed shortly after uh, the church was constructed. And again, very representative of their early style, which is geometric patterns, usually with the circle as their basis. Uh, Sweetest Heart of Mary. This is right down the street from St. Albertus. It's one of those uh, Polish Catholic churches I was talking about just a moment ago. I think Sweetest Heart of Mary has one of the most beautiful, if not the most beautiful interior uh, in the entire state of Michigan, definitely in the city of Detroit. This uh, window here, uh, uh, it uh, portrays the Holy Family, and we see a child Christ here helping his father Joseph with carpentry tasks, since we all know that Christ uh, was a carpenter. So uh, the uh, arch sections of the window with the circles and the six-pointed stars they're actually more representative of Detroit stained glass work style up to this point. But as we move further into the future, they get a little bit more heavily into narrative uh, windows where a story is told uh, through the glass. Let me give you just a few more shots of the interior here since it's uh, so grandiose and beautiful. I took my dad inside here for the first time uh, when he visited me recently. He lives in uh, suburban Phoenix and he's a Methodist and he was blown away by it. Go ahead, sir. Do you want to close them all the way? Ah, uh, yeah. Usually I give a little bit of light, but uh, I don't mind closing them all the way. I don't mind at all, uh, especially since it's my photograph photography that's being shown off here. Our next stop is going to be in Dearborn at a church built from 1928 to 1930, St. Alphonsus. And by this point, Detroit Stained Glass Works is a really well-established company making glass for about 70 years. And they start to get a little bit more modern edge to their looks. And we're seeing more narrative elements where they're depicting saints uh, and uh, biblical figures and Bible stories uh, in the windows. That's the choir loft window, uh, probably my favorite at the church. But uh, the uh, Lancet windows in the, uh, in the sanctuary are really great as well. Uh, now we're going to move into Ann Arbor, and this is a Methodist church, and Methodists, generally speaking, are a little bit closer to Quakers and Baptists, and they usually don't have really uh, super expressive stained glass in their churches, but there are exceptions. And it says First Methodist Episcopal here, but it's actually First United Methodist, it's known as now. This is right at the uh, corner of State and Huron, and these are uh, presumably installed right around the time uh, that the church is opened in 1938. This is the window that faces the street. And on the opposite side of the sanctuary, we have a pretty nice uh, rose window here. And for those of you who don't know, rose window is a convention, a word that they use for pretty much any circle yellow window these days, whether it has tracery or not. That's like these sculpted stone elements here. 
But originally, rose windows were supposed to emulate the look of a rose, and these are supposed to be petals. But these days, if it's round and it's got stained glass in it, anybody will call it a rose window. Uh, we're going to move back to suburban Detroit here, to the city of Birmingham, a holy name Catholic church built in 1954. And we can see that they're getting even more modern in their expression of biblical stories and saints. I uh, love this church not only for its stained glass, but it also has sculpture by Parducci in and outside of it. And also another artisan that we're going to cover here in just a second by the name of Andrew Malia. So that's my last example uh, for Detroit stained glass. We're now going to move on to a company that I'm guessing pretty much everyone here has heard of at one time or another, and that is Tiffany Studios of New York City. Tiffany is unique among stained glass makers in that they have a product line that's not really similar to other stained glass makers. Other stained glass makers, if they branch out into other uh, fields, it's usually into ecclesiastical, ecclesiastical sculpture or mosaics or uh, murals. Uh, Tiffany, they're making jewelry, they're making pottery, home and office decor. So this really sets them apart uh, from other companies that are producing stained glass. But also, Louis Comfort Tiffany is one of the greatest uh, artists that America has ever produced. His father, Charles Lewis Tiffany, actually founds the company as a partnership in 1837, but it's Lewis, the son, who really launches the uh, company into international renown. And we've got a bunch of great examples of Tiffany uh, in uh, the metro area. We're going to start in Ypsilanti. This is uh, at the, uh, um, uh, uh, oh, it's, oh, which building is it in now? It's in the Ipsy Historical Building now, and it was originally installed in a building just a couple doors to the south, the Ladies' Library Building. It's originally known as the Starkweather Library Building, which eventually became the Ypsilanti Public Library. Well, uh, this window got transplanted into uh, uh, the Historical Museum building just a couple uh, uh, addresses north. But if you drive by slowly when you're in this part of Ypsilanti, just look to your right and you will see that there is a new piece of stained glass in the uh, Ladies Library building that is, is this exact size, but not quite as nice as the Tiffany, obviously. Uh, also in Ann Arbor, right kitty corner from the uh, First United Methodist Church, we have what was formerly the First Unitarian Universalist Church, but it hasn't been this for many years. And it is now the offices of Hobbs and Black, a local architectural firm. A uh, really great Richardsonian Romanesque design that if you step inside, you will find has a great Tiffany uh, piece of glass inside. And if you look real closely, right down here at the bottom, recessed in the wood a little bit, you just barely make out Tiffany Glass and Decorating Company, New York. And uh, that's one great thing about Tiffany is they frequently put a corporate insignia on their windows, which makes uh, the year of production often is given, but also it makes the attribution to the Tiffany Company absolutely irrefutable. Uh, at Starkweather Memorial Chapel uh, at Highland Cemetery in Ypsilanti, this is a really great historic is a guy named George D. Mason, and he ended up designing the Grand Hotel on Mackinac Island, as well as the Detroit Masonic Temple. So he's a person that's super important to Detroit's uh, and Michigan's architectural legacy. I believe I've got one more shot of uh, three more windows inside. These are getting a rehab treatment uh, in the very near future, if it's not already. Uh, recently? Okay, great. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I'm going to have to call my friend who got me inside and see if I can get inside again. And see, uh, These were shot probably about uh, two years ago, so uh, before uh, a rehab was done on them. Uh, I understand, just to give you an example, you can see these yellow panes here, but there's one that's blue. That's one that got blown out and got replaced with the color they had available at some point. So that can happen often uh, with stained glass, uh, you know, with the money isn't there to make it as perfect as it was when it was originally installed. Sometimes you'll see evidence of a repair job that isn't that great. This is not my favorite, but probably my second favorite Tiffany in the Detroit area. And one of the main reasons it ranks that high for me is, again, that it's secular. And secular subject matter is way less common than ecclesiastical subject matter, which makes it slightly more interesting. This is a kind of neoclassical uh, influence here with, uh, I, I guess this is maybe a child uh, pan playing some flutes. I'm not really exactly sure who these figures are intended to be, but they're defi it's definitely not made for a church. This was made for a private residence, the George L. Beecher, Beecher residence, 
that has now been absorbed uh, into the campus of Wayne State University, and there's uh, now administrative offices inside this building. Uh, in downtown Ypsilanti again, at the First Presbyterian Church, this uh, building is originally built in 1857 with a single central spire, but it undergoes a massive renovation in 1898-99, uh, where they add two outer spires, take down the one in the middle, and they also add a Tiffany window, a Tiffany Rose window at that point. And I really love comparing this to one of the examples you find in my New Orleans stained glass book at the Myra Claire Rogers Chapel uh, on two, at Tulane University. Uh, this is actually a transplant. It got transplanted there in the 70s. This was originally created in the 1890s for the Newcomb uh, College uh, Chapel at a different, uh, different place in uh, the New Orleans city limits. But these uh, Celtic braids on the outside, the similarities are absolutely uncanny. Uh, leading me to the conclusion that these probably rode off, uh, rolled off their factory floor within five each years of each other uh, minimum, but uh, maybe even closer. Could have been one after the other for all we know. But uh, amazing uh, comparison there to, uh, between two windows in completely opposite ends of the country. Uh, let's move on now to Willett Studios of Philadelphia. And I really like to cover Willett closely because between about the 1920s and maybe the 1960s, Will it dominates fine, uh, fancy window installations in churches in the Detroit metro area, and they've got a bunch of great local examples. Uh, the company's founded in eight, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I think it's 1898 as Will it Stained Glass Studios. They operate under this corporate moniker till approximately 1977, at which point they're uh, taken over by uh, Hauser uh, Art Glass is the name of the company, and they get a new corporate moniker at that time, Will it Hauser Architectural Glass. And then in 1997, that company is absorbed into Associated Crafts. But Willett Hauser is still part of their corporate moniker if you go to their website. So this is just like the Tiffany case. The father is a real pioneer, and he gets the company started. But it's the son, Henry Lee Willett, that really brings the country into national prominence uh, during the course of his uh, lifetime. And then they also spawn a... Um, E. Crosby Willett is Henry Lee's son, and they're shown in the two, in the photo on the left there, that's uh, uh, Henry Lee on the near side and E. Crosby uh, towards the back there. So Willett still exists, but they're not making as high quality windows as they did in their heyday. Let's look at some of their uh, primo stuff from uh, uh, when they were doing their best work. This is a St. Andrew's Episcopal Church, which I believe we have a couple members here. So you guys have probably gotten a good look at these windows. There's other makers present at St. Andrews. Not everything is a Willett window. But Willett is really good about leaving their corporate moniker on windows. <laughs> these are all from St. Andrews, and they let us know that these are installed long after the church is built between 1949 and 1964. Uh, there's a lot of really interesting details in these windows, and one of my favorite is, of course, Angel Hall on the campus of the University of Michigan, designed by Albert Kahn, about whom I wrote a book. And this is one of his most formal, uh, fancy designs he does over the course of his career. Uh, moving back into the city now, the Cathedral of the Most Blessed Sacrament on Woodward Avenue uh, in the Boston Edison area of Detroit. This uh, is originally built from 1913 to 1919. And it's just a common Catholic church. But the archdiocese decides they want a cathedral in the uh, mid uh, 20th century. So they end up adding a couple towers out front here. Parducci produces all the sculpture for those towers. Uh, but I'm, the glass, I'm not sure exactly when it gets installed. To me, it's too modern looking uh, to be uh, in the original uh, dates of 1913 to 1919. But all these windows are elevated, and you don't get to see a corporate insignia on one of them in the entire church. So it's really hard to make a call about when these were uh, installed. I might come across the, uh, um, uh, the information at some point. So I shot these really early in my stained glass shooting career, back when I was more concerned about showing the stained glass within the context of the church. So you don't get as many good looks of what's actually happening in the glass with these photos. Uh, now I'm way more into getting the actual narrative detail and uh, being less concerned with the uh, church context. It's probably my uh, best shot of uh, the interior there. Uh, you'll notice how modern the lighting here is. 
This church has been modernized a couple times to the chagrin of many Catholics who preferred the much more uh, traditional look uh, of its original construction. Uh, another Methodist church with a ton of stained glass, which is, again, really uncommon. This is Metropolitan Methodist on uh, Woodward uh, in Midtown Detroit. And it is very uncommon to see a Methodist church looking this grandiose. I mean, I think most people, if they didn't know it was Methodist, would immediately jump to the conclusion this is a Catholic interior. But it is not. On one side of the sanctuary, we have uh, scenes from the life of Christ as a youngster. And on the opposite side of the sanctuary, we have scenes from the life of Christ as a full-grown adult. Let's get just a little bit closer in on the detail there. Really beautiful stuff. Quite a few uh, Bible stories told through the glass as well. Over the high altar with uh, some really great tracery there is, of course, uh, Christ with, uh, I think, the Elfland Omegas in there somewhere, isn't it? Mm, maybe not. Uh, and some uh, really great detail shots that, again, show us our years of installation and creation. And I always enjoy a church, almost all churches that have a huge Christian stained glass installation have a representation of the devil, at least in one small spot. And that's something I frequently look for because Satan can be uh, 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 portrayed in so many different ways uh, on glass. It's always unique, to, uh, interesting to see what the artist comes up for. Uh, for that representation. Uh, right after this church is done, uh, the same architect, William Ian Hunter, goes to work on Gross Point Memorial Presbyterian. It gets some additions in the 60s, but we're not as concerned about those because they don't have the great stained glass. Uh, these uh, stained glass, these willet windows, they uh, uh, portray mostly saints and biblical stories, which gets to be a very common a story when you're studying stained glass that is the most common su subject matter for churches, but just really beautifully rendered. Pretty much every one of these windows is dedicated to really important uh, people in Detroit's history. Uh, I believe one of these is uh, dedicated to people in the Brush family. Brush Street is uh, they're almost certainly descendants of the Brushes, after which Brush Street is named for. And uh, this one right here is Theodore Henry Hinchman. That is the father of the henchman that goes on to be one of the partners in Smith Henchman and Grills, a super important Detroit architectural firm uh, of that era, or the era immediately after that. Uh, here we uh, have a couple uh, close-in details, something I try to do much more often these days. On the left, you'll note how morbid this photo looks. This is one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And on the right, we have a call for a prison reform, which I think is a really great cause and a really great window. Uh, again, Willett is always putting their corporate insignia on everything, so we never have to wonder about will it, when Willett windows were made or installed. They almost always let you know. Uh, here's a later installation at Gross Point, which I find really interesting because you hardly ever see a set of double doors like this with stained glass embedded uh, within it. And this is a 20-frame uh, piece here that tells the story of the quest for the Holy Grail, and it's, uh, in, it's uh, installed later in 1948. What's next? Uh, historic Trinity Lutheran Church. This is right by Eastern Market, between downtown and Eastern Market, and this is definitely one of the most historic churches uh, in Detroit. Uh, it's not nearly as big as this photo of the sanctuary makes it look, which is one of my favorite things about it. And one of my favorite things about a lot of well-designed churches is that the proper massing of elements uh, inside or outside can create the illusion of more grandiose space or much more space than is actually there. And that is the sign of a really skilled architect when dealing with full masonry constructions, in my personal opinion. I uh, can't, can't tell you which side of the sanctuary this is on, but I believe this uh, depicts mostly scenes from the life of Christ. And here's another example of back when I was trying to shoot and show more of the context of the church. And I really do love this shot and how I got it through the arch, but we really don't get a lot of detail about what's actually happening in the windows here. Uh, back in Washtenaw County, a really, really old building, St. Luke's Episcopal Church, is built in 1858. But I have it later in my list because the windows don't actually get installed until 1945 to 1949. And there's a few other makers at this church uh, as well. But uh, the Lancet windows in the main sanctuary, uh, for the most part, are Willett uh, creations. 
And one more surprisingly thoroughly decorated Methodist church you'll find in uh, Birmingham. This is built 1951, 1952. Uh, not every window here is a Willet, but the vast majority are. And one of my, uh, again, tons of makers marks, but uh, one of my favorite installations in this church is in their choir practice room. Uh, we have a window that has quite a few different mus musical references. We've got uh, Bach here. We've got uh, Wesley. I'm not sure what his contribution is to music, but the Ministry of Music is also mentioned. We've got some instrument players at the top. But the coolest part of this window is the massive signature that Henry Lee Willett leaves. And it's pretty uncommon to see a signature that big uh, on windows. I always love it when I find one that, uh, that is done that large. You can see how big this pane is right here in the corner. This is that exact pane right there. Uh, a few more from inside First United Methodist uh, of Birmingham. These are in the main sanctuary. And a few more, apparently. <laughs> Got quite a few uh, uh, for this uh, one. And now we're going to move on to a church that is right in my neighborhood. I live in Berkeley, Michigan. This church is about a half mile from me. It's built in the mid-50s by an architect that designs hundreds of churches in the 50s, Harold E. Wagoner. And their stained glass is installed in the years immediately after uh, the church is constructed. And this is kind of the more detail-oriented shooting that I've been getting into uh, lately, which I think is uh, more interesting than shooting uh, far away after a few years of uh, developing my technique. Again, scenes from the life of Christ, which you can expect in almost any church that has a, a stained glass installation. Uh, a quintuple lancet windows on either side of the sanctuary here. And you'll notice pretty easily, this church is built out of cinder block, very common building material but used in such a way that it's graceful enough that it is fitting for the interior of a church. And not often is a cinder block that exposed in a, a formal building like this. So uh, I actually uh, really like this use of those materials. A few more close-ups here. Uh, we've also got some uh, really important historical figures. John Monteith is super important to the early years of the University of Michigan and has a Detroit Public Library named after him as well. And obviously, Martin Luther is, uh, you know, the person that uh, is most responsible for the development of the Protestant churches of Christianity. More Maker's Marks. You never find a Willet installation without Maker's Marks. Even at the Cathedral of the Most Blessed Sacrament, I can't see them because the windows are too high up. I'd pretty much guarantee you they're there if you got up on a ladder to go find them. We're now going to move to a much more modern maker. Uh, Atelier Loire is founded by a guy by the name of Gabriel Loire in uh, France in the 20th century. And he is a world pioneer and leader in the development of Dal de Verre glass, which literally translates to slab of glass. And these are windows made with much thicker pieces of glass that are held together by a matrix of epoxy or cement. So it's a much different process creating these kind of windows than it is uh, creating uh, typical lead line glasses, which, what, which is what we've seen thus far. So you guys have probably seen Dahl and you'll recognize this look that I show you in just a second. I just have a short list of some really important commissions that they've done over the course of their uh, existence. Charters, Charters Cathedral is by far the most prestigious and obviously, uh, they uh, installed it long after the church uh, was built, but uh, to even have a single window inside Charters Cathedral is very prestigious for any stained glass maker. And I can't remember when they in installed those ones, but it was in the 20th century. Well, we've got a couple great Gabriel Loire examples right here in Ann Arbor. And the first one is at the Chapel of the Holy Trinity on the campus of Concordia University, built in 1962. This is a really awesome modern church design that I really love. And it gets three different major Loire windows installed between 63 and 66. And Gabriel even leaves a signature in a couple of places. Gabriel Loire's company, I would say is about 50-50 as to whether you're gonna find a signature on their glass. A lot of times, in a contract to create glass for a Catholic church, there will be a stipulation as to whether they're allowed to leave their signature or not. And we'll see another example where he's not allowed. Well, I don't know if not allowed is the phrase we want to use, but where he doesn't leave a signature elsewhere in Ann Arbor. Uh, here's our first uh, major window. 
Uh, these are at the entrances here. And then there's one more that is uh, uh, behind the high altar. So you guys ever get a chance to step inside this uh, uh, sanctuary? Highly recommend it. Really, really gorgeous inside. And they usually leave it unlocked during weekdays at regular school hours. Now we're at 2250 East Stadium at St. Francis of Assisi Catholic Church, built in 67, 68. And these are pretty simplistic uh, Loire designs. They're uh, abstract. There's not any really narrative elements. Uh, you know, it probably has some biblical backing, but it's all abstracted to the point where you really don't know what that biblical backing is until you talk to uh, one of the creators and they tell you. So uh, there's another equal-sized window on the opposite side of the sanctuary there, and once again, abstract designs. Uh, still a pretty respectable window, but I don't think quite as interesting as what you find at uh, the Chapel of the Holy Trinity at Concordia. Uh, one more example of Loire in the metro area uh, is uh, installed at the exact same time uh, in Allen Park at St. Francis Cabrini. Uh, and I find these much more interesting than the St. Francis of Assisi uh, examples because we have narrative elements in the windows. Creating narrative elements is a little bit harder with Dal de Ver because Dal glass, you rarely paint on it. So it's hard to do people's faces. It's all just pieces of glass that these forms, these faces are formed with. Whereas regular leaded glass, you can paint the face right on the glass, and that's what's usually done. Not always, but usually. So to be able to make this convincing of faces uh, in dial slabs is to me really super impressive, and there's a few uh, different examples uh, throughout the building. I uh, really dig this one. I photographed high school athletics in uh, uh, the Down River area of Detroit, and I occasionally get sent to this church because a, they have their own school at this church, and they're one of the athletic departments that we cover at our studio. So I've actually photographed a few First Communions here and some graduations here, and that's when I got the opportunity to really uh, shoot their glass uh, in an artistic fashion as well. So uh, 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 Loire gives us a great example to transist to a modern Detroit, Detroit maker by the name of Andrew Armalia. Malia died in 74, but he was a really progressive, forward-thinking person that kind of pushed the uh, a design of Dahl into the future. But he also made lead-lined glass, so uh, he's a really multidisciplined guy. He also did painting, and he also made mosaics. Uh, we'll see some evidence of uh, his presence in the Detroit area with his letterhead at the top, dated 1971. His studio was just north of Comerica Park. Uh, just north of 75, in down, the downtown, near the downtown area. This is uh, one of his, uh, an example from one of his mosaics, and he would frequently uh, leave signatures in mosaics, but he doesn't do it with uh, stained glass. At least I haven't found an example yet where he leaves his signature in stained glass. So Malia, he uh, is born in Sicily in 1911, but he immigrates to Detroit in the 30s. Uh, and he ends up uh, in the paper quite frequently over the course of his career. Uh, this church right here has been torn down, so no evidence of this work remains. Uh, this is just a, now about a year before he dies, and uh, he's a person that's very concerned with the uh, continuation of the art of stained glass making, and that ends up in the paper uh, on a few occasions as well. And in 1957, he gets a two-page spread in the uh, magazine supplement to the Detroit Times. And I really live this, love this article uh, because it shows this uh, mural right here. You guys take a good look at it. And we advance to the next frame. We'll see it is the mural that is inside the present-day holy name Catholic Church in Birmingham, the same place that had the Detroit stained glass uh, works from the 1950s. So Malia, he's got lots of... Uh, 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 mosaics like this in churches where he's also uh, installed stained glass. So I'm going to step outside of the metro area here for just a second uh, because I want to show off to you guys what a modernist Malia was and that he was an expert in the creation of Dal de Ver windows in addition to his leaded work. So I actually hate this addition right here because it covers up the original church and this isn't how you make a sympathetic addition. But on the other hand, I love it, because that's where Malia's windows are. And these are great examples of his style of making doll windows. On the entrance stairway, there's an even more modern uh, example of crucified Christ that's super, super stylized. Really love this piece. In fact, 
I'm loosely debating using this image right here as the cover of uh, my book when it comes out. I'm not sure I will, but it's definitely in the running. So I just wanted to show you guys an example uh, of his really uh, most modern windows. And this is in Jackson, not too far from Ann Arbor, but not really in the metro area. Let's look at some in the metro area. We'll start off with St. Matthew Catholic Church. This is on the far east side of Detroit. Uh, I'm not sure if this church is still up and running, but when I made these photographs uh, a few years ago, they were still uh, doing masses regularly. Uh, we can see it's traditional lead line glass, but it does definitely have a modern edge to it. And I love how many colors uh, he's incorporating here. But what's probably most impressive at this church is uh, one of his uh, mosaic works. Uh, here's some more examples of the leaded glass. But here's a massive half dome over the altar that incorporates over a million pieces of a mosaic tile, according to newspaper articles of the day. So again, Malia, master stained glass maker, but multidisciplined. He also paints and he makes amazing mosaics. Uh, Christ the King Catholic Church in Detroit. This is on the northwest side. Uh, this is considered very modern for the uh, era in which it was uh, installed. And Malia also produces at this location Stations of the Cross uh, in mosaic style. And this little trim right here around the mosaics, that's by Corrado Parducci, my favorite sculptor. Uh, my favorite window at Christ the King is in the choir loft. It's this triptych window that uh, faces the street. They light it at night. doesn't look as good from the outside as it does from the inside uh, here. I really love this piece. <laughs> Uh, definitely one of his most striking installations in all of the Detroit area is St. Scholastica Catholic Church, built in 1965. This church does not have uh, 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 services that often, but every once in a while. But it gets described as a church for the jet age in the uh, uh, newspaper articles when it first comes out, because I think we can see how modern it is. There's also a baptistry over here with a can't see it very well, but there's a mosaic of uh, Christ being baptized, baptized by St. John in there. That's also by Malia. But uh, one of the most interesting and most striking aesthetic elements of this church is the high altar on the opposite side that is kind of a reflection of uh, the stained glass, but in mosaic. And the priest at this church for many, many years was a super skilled mosaicist that was friends with Andrew Malia. And along with members of the congregation, this uh, mosaic uh, around the high altar was produced over uh, the number of many years. So a uh, really beautiful building that is very difficult to get inside. But I have found if you keep pushing and pushing and pushing, eventually somebody's going to let you get in there and make pro photographs. Okay, so that uh, wraps up uh, our uh, uh, Makers commonly represented in Detroit. We're going to go through a little section here now that's just churches uh, in Ann Arbor, uh, excuse me, Washtenaw County, that uh, have stained glass by makers that are not super heavily represented in the Detroit area. And we're going to start off with First Congregational at William and State first. Uh, the original. 1876 by a really important Detroit architect, Gordon W. Lloyd, who has many standing buildings throughout the state and even some outside of the state. Uh, this window uh, is unattributed, or at least I have not found an attribution for it. And I know a few people at First Congregational that are pretty well educated on their interior decor, and they're not sure either, but a uh, beautiful window nonetheless. Uh, some more uh, pattern windows with just the slightest amount of narrative elements, uh, Lamb of God, Tree of uh, Knowledge, a Lamp of Learning. But for the most part, uh, you know, uh, just geometric patterns here. And these uh, I don't have an attribution for either. Uh, but if we go over to the chapel, this is uh, uh, on William Street, kind of like right across from the New York Pizza Depot. The chapel was built in 1953. The architect is a U of M professor by the name of Ralph Hammett. And the chapel is named for a minister of the church with the last name of Douglas. I can't remember his first name. But Douglas, he's also an author, and he writes a really famous book called The Robe that got made into a Hollywood movie that maybe some of you have seen. Uh, he also wrote a book about uh, the life of Peter, uh, you know, uh, the, some people say the first pope. Uh, and that one uh, was also translated into a movie, but I cannot remember uh, the name of it just now. So in the regular chapel, we have these great, uh, conic windows, a really reputable maker from Boston. And the story is that these little medallion elements here at the bottom, these are actually inside uh, Douglas's home elsewhere in the country. 
Uh, he's got another home, and he loves them so much that when they hire Connick to produce these windows for the sanctuary, these medallions get taken out of the windows of his home and added into these windows. At least that's the story of one of the historians at, uh, at uh, First Congregational tells me. The most interesting window is the window that faces William Street in this chapel because it, it has uh, uh, references. This is to the robe, and this is to the one, a fisher of men, it says here. But that's not the name of the movie, but this one kind of loosely references the movie that's made based on the book that uh, Douglas has written about St. Peter. So that's definitely, I think, the most interesting uh, uh, window uh, in the between all of the buildings. Just my personal opinion, though. We're going to move now to downtown Ypsilanti. This is uh, the first Congregational United Church of Christ. It's originally built as Congregational Church. That's literally its name, the day they opened up. Uh, it gets dismantled and completely rebuilt in 1898. And this is presumably when the stained glass is installed, but I can't give you an exact date on that. I can tell you, though, that it's a really interesting company from Columbus, Ohio. Boo, go blue. Uh, the Von Gerichten Art Glass Company. And there's a really nice maker's mark on the windows there. This is now known as Ypsilanti Art Space. And uh, it's been uh, rehabbed to a certain extent. Sometimes they get live performances in here. Uh, I got to meet one of the people who led the renovation, so that was uh, really, uh, really interesting. And these are really super typical images for a Protestant church. Christ knocking on the door. Uh, Christ is the good shepherd. These are 16th, 17th century Lutheran images that get used over and over by Protestant churches all over the United States for a couple centuries on end. They still use them. There's no copyright on them, so anybody can use these in their windows, which actually makes this part of the window less interesting than these parts, because this is where we see completely unique material that is produced by the companies, you know, the minds of the company. Whereas the Christ is the Good Shepherd and, and uh, the previous Christ knocking on the door, exact same way you'll see it in thousands of Protestant churches all over the United States. Probably some outside of the United States also. Uh, still a really great collection here, but I prefer the art glass pieces. And when I say art glass, that usually means designs like this that don't have any painting on them. And the design is completely contingent on how fancy you can make the uh, flourishes in the glass paint panes look. All right, this is one of my favorite installations in all of Washtenaw County, if not the entire state of Michigan. This is the First Methodist Episcopal Church, downtown Ypsilanti, now known as First United Methodist. This is built in 1891, 1892 by a very highly reputed uh, Akron, Ohio-based firm named Weary and Kramer. And uh, George A. Meesh and Son of Chicago, Illinois, are commissioned to create the stained glass windows here. And they've got three different walls with installations this grandiose. And I just absolutely love them. Uh, this is the one we used for our advertisement for the lecture today. It's over uh, their high altar. This is about 20 feet high and maybe uh, uh, 12 feet, 15 feet wide. So it's very grandiose. And then we have another similar to the first one on the opposite side of the sanctuary. They're, uh, they're, uh, a loft seating there is getting a little bit weathered, though, don't you think? <laughs> maybe needs a little touch up there. Anyway, beautiful installation if you ever get a chance to step inside. Uh, and now we're on to Evangelical Bethlehem Church. Somebody said they went to this church. And this, are they still calling it Evangelical Bethlehem Church or Bethlehem United Church of Christ is what they're going by these days. But when it was uh, uh, first built, I believe it was Bethlehem Evangelical Lutheran. And uh, really super unique designs that look unlike hardly anything I've seen before because they're made by an obscure maker that I've never seen before or since. I'm going to try a pronunciation here. Glashuti Sean Munzak. Sean Munzak is actually a city in Germany. So this probably translates to stained glass factory uh, in Sean Munzak. But I can't say for sure. But Glashuti is used uh, as a word for a lot of stained glass uh, per, uh, per producers at this time in Germany. Uh, really beautiful, beautiful designs there. And again... This is exactly what I was talking about with the previous uh, installation at Ypsilanti Art Space. This is the Resurrection. This is the Ascension, both very commonly used in hundreds of church, Protestant churches throughout the nation. And I say Protestant, and I put an emphasis on that because Catholics almost always pay for original art. 
So even though you see the same Bible story depicted over and over from Catholic church to Catholic church, it's always done differently from uh, church to church. And there's almost always uh, an artist, an, a firm hired to create original art. And that's why I find Catholic church stained glass to be significantly more interesting uh, than Protestant stained, stained glass. Usually, not always though. St. Thomas the Apostle at the corner of uh, Elizabeth and State Street is a really gorgeous uh, Catholic church designed by Spear and Rones, the same designers as the Gandhi Dancer, which used to be a train station, and uh, the uh, Kelsey uh, Museum of Art, or what are we, Kelsey Museum of Archaeology, formerly known as Newberry Hall, is also a Spear and Rones design. Tappan Hall is also a Spear and Rones design, so they've got a big imprint in the city of Ann Arbor. And the... Uh, this church is beautiful as well as the stained glass installation, but I've never been able to find an attribution for this one. And I've uh, looked at some of the panels pretty closely, haven't been able to find a corporate insignia, and I haven't been able to find a church archive that identifies the makers. But I'm told that if I do a little bit deeper digging at Bentley, I might come up with it at some point. I hope I can someday, hopefully before I publish the book. Uh, right in downtown Ann Arbor again at the St. Mary Student Chapel. 331 Thompson Street. Uh, this is a building designed by J.J. Albert Rousseau and George McConkie, both of whom were instructors in architecture at the University of Michigan, built 1924 to 1925. And it is a collection of saints and biblical figures, all designed in this exact style. I've never come up with an attribution for this one either. Uh, another unattributed group of windows that I suspect is probably Willett, because uh, Willett really pioneers the medallion use in radius windows like this. But also it says Detroit in one of these little corners here. It might be here, it might be here. That kind of leads me on the Detroit stained glass works path, but it only says Detroit. It doesn't say anything else. So again, unattributed, but possibly by Willett, possibly by the Detroit stained glass company. This church has parodic. Corrado Parducci sculpture all over the outside. It's definitely one of my favorite church structures uh, in Washtenaw County. So a lot of people, when they find out that I'm really super heavily into stained glass, they want to know what are my favorite uh, collections. And I'm going to share with you just a few uh, in Detroit. And this is going to be the close of my lecture. We're going to start with Christ Church Episcopal in downtown Detroit, built in 1863. Same architect as First Congregational and St. Andrews in Ann Arbor, Gordon W. Lloyd. He does a ton of Episcopal churches over the course of his career. And this one is super interesting to me because there's seven different important makers uh, represented uh, at this church. We've got a couple Tiffany's. I love this is probably my, mm, I'm not going to say favorite because I'm building up to that actually. But <laughs> among my favorite Tiffany's uh, in the Detroit area, uh, they also have a Tiffany triptych window here. Another beauty. Uh, this uh, depicts a Hungarian saint, uh, I believe Saint Elizabeth, but I can't say for certain off the top of my head. Keaton Butler and Bain is a really super highly uh, regarded firm from England who designed this uh, major five lancet window. Uh, Jay Whipple, also from England, not as highly regarded as Heaton Butler and Bain, but still very notable. This uh, tells the story of the uh, uh, prodigal son in three frames. And then a much more modern installation, if I'm not mistaken, this one was installed in 1971 and, again, seems from the life of Christ. But I would just like to reiterate, Episcopalians, Catholics, way more likely to pay for original art that depicts the life of Christ in a way that it hasn't been depicted before, unlike the Protestants. So in addition to the three windows I just uh, showed you, we also have... Uh, these additional uh, six uh, makers represented at Christ Church. Now, some people don't like the chaotic look of having a bunch of different makers in a bunch of different styles. I personally do. If you like your church to look organized and everything to be congruous stylistically, probably not going to be your favorite church. Uh, Christ Church Cranbrook is in my lecture because this is one of the best examples in the entire country of uh, going all out in terms of uh, adding art to the church and tons of nationally renowned and internationally renowned artists uh, contributed to the, uh, uh, the beauty of this church uh, in its early years. Uh, this is uh, known as the West Window, also known as the Women's Window, uh, because it depicts uh, 
almost all women from the Bible or from somewhere in the uh, history of Christianity. I think the only exceptions are that maybe there's a little boy and a, a few angels in there. But for the most part, it's a, uh, uh, it's a window that celebrates the contributions of women. And then on the opposite side, uh, over the high altar, we have scenes from the life of Christ. Uh, and this window is designed by an artist that's nearly as important as Tiffany in his lifetime, Nicola, Nicola de Ascenso. And he is one of the top ecclesiastical uh, art makers of his generation. So super important uh, window there. Also, also worth noting the architect Bertram Grosvenor Goodhue. He's the designer of Nebraska State Capitol, and he's a really super progressive thinker uh, about American architecture uh, at this point in history. <clears throat> Here's one of my favorite examples uh, in the state of Michigan, if not the United States. This installation is inside the Dawson Great Lakes Museum on Belle Isle in Detroit, built in 1959 to 1960. It depicts a very fanciful scene of LaSalle landing on the banks of the Detroit River during his voyage of exploration. Well, most really good historians will tell you LaSalle probably didn't portage in Detroit. He probably just sailed right through. So that's why I say it's a fanciful depiction because he probably didn't actually do this but it's still a very historically relevant scene. And I personally love this Native American over here on the left. He's got this look in his eyes that kind of says, should we nip this thing in the bud right now? <laughs> so uh, uh, you're looking at this and probably thinking to yourselves, how did this end up in a building designed in the 1950s and 1960s? It's clearly way older than that. Well, the reason it's way older than that is it actually got transplanted from a side wheel steamer that uh, traveled the waters of the Great Lakes from the 1910s to the 1950s. And when it was decommissioned in 1956, a lot of the interior got dismantled and put into storage. And about 10 years later, a community group got the funds together to purchase the Gothic Room installation on, that use, was used to be on the ship and reinstall it in the Dawson Museum. Most, one of the most awesome stained glass installations you'll find anywhere in the area. If you get a chance, I highly recommend you check it out. We can't forget about our Hebrew friends. Uh, synagogues often have really notable stained glass, and Temple Bethel is a really, really great example for so many reasons. First interesting reason is this church is probably their, this uh, synagogue is probably their fourth structure. I, I can't say for sure, but I know three of them, and we're going to cover three of them right now. But this is the one they're using right now that's built in 1971, and the architect is Minoru Yamasaki. Does anybody know who that is? He is the designer of the World Trade Center and also the designer of the Mishkan Tower in uh, uh, downtown uh, Detroit, which a lot of people say was his practice for the World Trade Center. They're very stylistically similar. I, I just love how this uh, interior almost looks like an abstracted angel wing putting its wings around the congregation there. But what's up? My favorite thing about this uh, church is the stained glass installations. And this is a uh, modern that's uh, put in at the time the church is built. There's a, this is called New Jerusalem, and there's another one on the opposite side of the entry hallway called Old Jerusalem. And for a long time in the Jewish tradition, having narrative scenes in stained glass was taboo because there's kind of a, they're more concerned with worshiping golden calves. In the, uh, in the Hebrew faith than in Christianity, typically. So in a lot of synagogues, you'll see no narrative glass at all, no objects from reality, just patterns and abstraction. But that's liberalized uh, in the last half century. So that's why we actually have uh, windows with actual things from reality depicted within it. But what's even more interesting than those windows are the ones that were transplanted from the previous temple that was at 8801 Woodward in Detroit, an Albert Kahn design that's in my book. These are uh, all created by Hineke of Smith of New York City and installed presumably around 1922, 1923. And again, they almost all represent uh, Old Testament figures. But we're not done yet. We got another set of windows. Oh, this is the building that these were transplanted from uh, right on Woodward in the city. But we have another set of windows in one of their hallways before you get in the main sanctuary. And these, this set of windows, they're in a hallway that's all glass, so they're backlit by sunlight. They're all transplanted from the previous 
old, old Temple Beth L at 3424 a Woodward, which is now known as the Bonstell Theater in a Wayne State University property. This is about to go undergo a renovation, and they're going to try to bring it back to the original appearance of when it was a Jewish synagogue. And it's going to look awesome when they're done because the company that's managing it has done quite a few historical renovations in Detroit, and they really know what they're doing. All right, so this is my last entry, you guys, and it could have just as easily gone in my Tiffany section, but I decided to put it at the end because these are probably my favorite windows in Detroit. And one of the very first installations I photographed that, you know, inspired me to become a master at photographing stained glass. These are installed at uh, Cass Avenue Methodist Episcopal, now known as Cass Community Methodist, in about 1901. And... You'll see that there's hardly any painting on these, that the entire design is almost all little tiny individual panes. This is a ridiculously meticulous uh, installation. And you should be impressed enough with these three windows here, but when you see the main window, so this one available, it's my last one. If you guys wanna look at it at the table, only $20. <laughs> But I think you guys can see why this is one of my favorite uh, uh, windows anywhere. And uh, the, the one person that has written a book about uh, stained glass in Detroit, they put this one on their cover. And uh, I can't blame them. That name of that book is Discovering Stained Glass in Detroit, if you guys uh, care to hunt it down. So that's my last uh, installation there, you guys. And that concludes my lecture. I just want to remind you that uh, my books are available at dale-a-carlson.squaresite. But they're also available at quite a few retailers in the metro area if you care to uh, uh, support a local retailer. And they're also available on Amazon. But I get a much better deal here. So if you guys are planning on buying something online, try to use this site. All three of my books I have on sale uh, today for $5 less than the cover price uh, if any of you are interested. Thank you so much for your attention, folks. I hope you enjoyed that. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, ma'am. Well, you can leave your uh, email address with me. Um, I actually try to remind myself to collect email addresses at events like these so that I can uh, add you to my mailing list and inform you of upcoming lectures. I feel like I've got a really uh, solid relationship with the Ann Arbor District Library now and that I'll probably be back uh, within, within, you know, six months, and I would love to keep you all informed of that. So anybody who's got a business card with an email address on it or just wants to jot it down, you can leave it on the table, and I'll add you to my mailing list. Uh, I don't necessarily give updates on when books are coming out on that mailing list, though, but that's an idea worth considering. My next book that's going to come out long before the stained glass book is actually uh, it's about Albert Kahn. Albert Kahn, when he was... Uh, um, a youngster, he won a $500 scholarship in 1891, and the stipulation of the scholarship was that he go to Europe and spend nine months there and uh, hand, freehand draw uh, a classical architecture, which he did. U of M Museum of Art, it holds 276 of those drawings, and they've given me permission to uh, include them all in a book that... I've finished all the work on the images for it, but I haven't written the text yet. I was hoping to do that this summer, but I've been so busy I haven't been able to yet. But that book will almost certainly be out by the end of 2023. Uh, the stained glass book, probably not going to come out till at least 2025 because Detroit is such a huge metro area. I've got Washington and Oakland County covered really good, but I've still got a lot of uh, places to hit in Macomb and Wayne before that book is going to be ready. But if you leave me your email address, I'll try to remember to update you on when the book's coming out. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Uh huh. Ah, I gotcha. Uh, Swedish Heart of Mary down in Detroit is having a pierogi festival this weekend, and the church is going to be wide open, so you can see those beautiful stained glass windows at your leisure. Ah, I gotcha. Well, thank you for the tip. I'm actually going to the Shari Vari Festival at Fort Wayne this weekend, which is a techno music festival. So. I may or may not, but that is a church that you can see as evidenced by my photos. I've been inside many, many times, but that's <laughs> well, pol polka is techno before they had synthesizers. You know what I'm saying? I also feel that way about uh, um, 
what is the uh, Mexican uh, music uh, they call it? Uh, um, mariachi. mariachi. I also think of his uh, 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 pre-synthesizer techno. <laughs> Any, anybody else with another question? Yes, sir. So I used to love going to Materials Unlimited. Mm -hmm. I've been in there. Oh my gosh! Yep. I'm so sorry. They're going. So for someone that is in the market for stained glass, mm -hmm. would you have any generous? You've already been very generous, so thank you. But any thoughts about where someone who is interested in purchasing it might might find some? Well, architectural salvage warehouses are probably the first place uh, that you want to start. Um, I'm not really sure who's taken up the slack since Materials Unlimited has shut down, but a little bit of net searching, you'll probably be able to find a few places that do that kind of business uh, in the metro area. Uh, I've got a few friends in the Detroit area that try to do salvage work when they know buildings are going to come down. They're more into salvaging sculpture than windows, but I have heard quite a few stories over the years of uh, churches that are completely condemned uh, where a company can come in and take down the windows. Making a deal with that kind of company, though, is probably significantly more difficult. First, you got to find out about them, but then you got to be willing to shell out because those classically made old windows that get removed from churches, they demand a huge, huge premium, and it's not cheap at all. I mean, be ready to spend five to 20 grand if you want a really grandiose window like that. You know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, I'm so, so sorry I don't have more direction for you, but go ahead, ma'am. Just a quick, a quick one. Um, I, my hometown, Grove City, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. which is uh, north of Pittsburgh, roughly, very small town with about like 9,000 people when I lived there. But the Catholic, our Catholic church there, uh, the stained glass was imported from Italy. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, um, of the European countries you seem to mention, uh, London, right? As one of the, England is one of the places. Mm -hmm. um, would there be particular European countries that were best known yes. for quality stained glass? These were incredible. Uh, probably the most highly regarded city in the world for stained glass is Munich, Germany. And that is where Franz Meyer and FX Zettler both had their corporate offices for a couple centuries. I considered including them in the uh, lecture today because they're so important to the history of a stained glass. But uh, uh, there's, there's, I didn't have enough examples to put them in the, uh, uh, you know, well-represented makers. If you remember the first set of glass I showed you from St. Joseph Shrine, that is a great uh, Meyer example, actually. And there's a, there's a few others. Mayer is really super well re represented in New Orleans, and there's quite a few Mayer examples in my New Orleans book there. But because two really major companies were centered there, and usually if a, a company has a you know sent over century foothold, mm -hmm. even if it's in a major city, it's usually just one company that dominates in a big city. So for Munich to have two really big companies, and they also had a place called the Royal Bavarian Stained Glass Manufactory. So it also makes it an interesting example because most big stained glass houses, they're designing and fabricating in the same location. Mm -hmm. In Munich, there would be different design houses, and they would all go to the central fabricator in town and get their stuff fabricated at the same place. So historically, Mayer and Zettler, most people talk about them like they're competitors, but they're also collaborators on many levels, too. In fact, one of the granddaughters in the Zettler family marries into the Mayer family, and then in the middle 20th century, Mayer absorbs Zettler's company completely. So uh, Munich, Germany is definitely, the, in my opinion, the most important, the capital of stained glass making. Uh, but uh, Innsbruck, uh, Austria is also really important. London is obviously really important. I have not yet run across a maker from Italy that, uh, um, that, that I've run into repeatedly which is kind of surprising to me because the Vatican is there. And, think of Venice or, Venetian or, or even Rome, you know? I mean, that's the center of Catholicism, and those are the people that make the best stained glass. So I'm actually kind of surprised that I don't have an Italian maker to share any stories with. But I would pretty much guarantee that there is probably a, cent a city in Italy, I don't know which one it is, that is probably most important to their stained glass history. I might have to go look into that. Good question. All right. We've actually got a, we've now reached 315. So let's let Dale sell his books and you can ask him questions. You, you guys got another uh, thing coming up in this room? We just need to start speaking down the chat. But 
Well, okay. Yeah, yeah, help yourself. Those are my those are my uh uh let the public handle models. I have a brand brand new mint versions of all of them uh uh here uh, uh under the table. <laughs> <laughs> 